Hey folks, welcome back to the show. I hope you all really enjoyed SAMSI month for the last month. We're gonna be doing a little bit of an RBF style decorrelation from SAMSI topics. We will still be discussing some research that is done or related to researchers at SAMSI, but our guest today is Lily Wong from Iowa State University. Um, she'll be covering some, what I think is a really interesting topic. Um, she'll be talking about COVID-19, but what I think is most interesting about this is that she's gonna be really doubling down on one of the main themes that we've been covering, for example, in John Nardini's episode and Jeannie Lee's episode, where there's a difference between the statistical modeling approaches and the mathematical modeling approaches, which are uh, attempt to model more of those generative processes. And so Lily will be walking us through that today. It's a really interesting presentation that combines a lot of cool stuff. She also just does a great job. So if you're listening to audio, don't forget to hop on to YouTube to enjoy this one um, so that you can see her cool slides and everything. So Lily, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I fear that we should maybe just, just to get started, maybe you could introduce yourself and your general research interests before we go into this, uh, this exact presentation. I'm Lily Wang. I'm an associate professor from uh, Iowa State University. So my general research interest is in um, data science, statistical learning for complex features. And also I'm doing a lot of non-parametric, uh, uh, semi-parametric regression methods and uh, high dimensional spatial temporal data analysis. Uh, so today, uh, especially as Glenn said, I'm going to share with you some of our research recently done by uh, related with COVID-19. That's really great. And um, just to make the SAMSI connection a little bit stronger, uh, Lily is uh, friends and co-researchers with Jinyi Li, who is oh, also yeah. our, new, our new friend. Um, so uh, looking forward to this and seeing some of, you know, one, it's interesting in its own right. It's also just really interesting to see the span of research topics that people can cover in biomedical fields. Um, so I guess without further ado, we should hop on to, Lily, we'll hop onto your presentation and enjoy it. Okay, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for sharing your time today with me. Uh, I'm going to report some of our recent research about uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, modeling and forecasting. Um, the novel coronavirus outbreak started in last December has expanded to touch nearly every corner of the world. On January uh, 21st, the first confirmed case in the United States was reported. And you can see on March 26, the U.S. started to lead the world in COVID-19 cases. And recently, the outbreak was continuing to spread with cases arriving, uh, arising in many states as government started to ease restrictions and Americans try to return to their routines. So this week, according to um, New York Times database, the U.S. suppressed 2.2 million in the coronavirus, total coronavirus cases. Okay, so uh, an essential question for developing a defense against COVID-19 is to understand how far the virus will spread and how many lives it will claim. It is not clear to anyone where this uh, uh, virus or this crisis will lead us. So one way to answer this question is through scientific modeling. So we started our research work as a group since the outbreak of COVID-19. Um, our research aims to help the local community and guide uh, evidence-based decision-making. Um, so here on the screen, you can see some of our research goals. So number one, we would like to develop a dynamic epidemic modeling framework to study the spatial temporal pattern of the spread of COVID-19. And we also want to um, uh, investigate how the factors contribute to the spread of COVID-19. And the third goal is to estimate and forecast the spatial temporal pattern of the spread of virus in the United States up to the um, local county level. And finally, we would like to provide a user-friendly tool to visualize, track, 
and predict the infected cases and death cases of COVID-19 in the United States. All right, so this slide show you a summary of our research and products. So basically, we investigated the disease dynamics by working at the interface of mathematical modeling and statistical modeling. By combining the advantages of the mathematical and statistical modeling tools, we developed a novel spatial temporal um, epidemic model, we call it a STEM, uh, to study the infection and death count. Uh, we do it at the county level, and the proposed methodology can be used to dissect the um, spatial structure and the dynamics of the spread, as well as used to assess uh, how this outbreak may unfold through time and space in the future. And based on our like, uh, research findings, we have also developed uh, many, many r shining apps embedded into um, COVID-19 dashboard. So this dashboard provides a, a real-time seven-day forecast as well as a, a long-term projection in the next four months. Um, the proposed method uh, through our investigation shows a remarkably accurate uh, short-term predictions at the county level. Yeah, at the county level, this is actually what really struck me as what was like really interesting about your work to begin with that, you know, a common critique of a lot of this modeling, you know, when you look at, for example, when you're trying to do modeling on the national level, it's a little bit strange to say, oh, we're going to be modeling an infection rate on a national level because there are so many diverse dynamics at these okay. lower levels and these lower granularities, you know, where there's a, there's a difference. Um, I think there's a little bit of a uh, misconception where when the, U the U.S. is basically comprises a continent and um, or the better part of a con oh, not actually the better part of a continent. Canada has more landmass, but, you know, a, a large part, a large part of a large continent. And so the idea that um, we would be only making projections on a national level seems to lose a lot of those dynamics. So when I first saw your work, I was really impressed to see one that you were breaking down onto the county level, um, which even probably has its own challenges, because, as you know, some counties are larger than others and things like that. Um, there are some very specific, you know, one adjacent county might be farther away from a population center than another than two other adjacent counties. Um, so I thought that was really interesting that you guys understood the uh, the value of that and um, we're trying to model that. And also, I really liked how you're breaking down the short term forecast versus the long term forecast, because, you know, there are a large number of changing dynamics in here. And to provide that extra context, I think it really shows a great appreciation of the, you know, the mechanisms, both clinically, biologically, and epidemiologically that are occurring. So I thought that was cool. And then just as icing on the cake, I loved how you guys, you're having your mathematical modeling as one process and you're using statistical modeling on top of that or combining them nicely. So I think this really shows a great foresight and understanding of the types of information that should be brought into play and also an understanding of the shortcomings of these models, which is really what I think we need to have in these conversations. So I appreciate this. It looks really great. Thank you very much for the comments. Yeah, actually our motivation, one of the, our motivation is to help the local community. So if we want to, that's one of the reasons we want to down to the county level. And we hope, I mean, later if we have a reliable data on the community level, that will be even better. But so far, we just have the data at the county level. So we hope uh, uh, with the detailed information, we can help the local community better. Okay. So now uh, let's take a look of the, the data we, we studied. So the data uh, included the reported confirmed COVID-19 infections, deaths and recoveries at the county level, uh, which are reported from 48 um, mainland states and the District of Columbia. So in total, we have uh, 3,104 counties. And the aggregated COVID-19 cases are from uh, January 20th up till uh, today. So my research team at the beginning, we collected all the uh, COVID-19 daily reported data from uh, many open sources, um, including some of the main sources you've probably already seen, like the New York Times, um, COVID-19 um, 
uh, repository by John Hopkins University and the COVID-19 tracking project um, by the Atlantic and also the USA facts. We compared the similarities and the differences among them and we also created our um, uh, database and it is saved in the GitHub I will show you later. So these data sources are automatically updated every day or every other day. Um, we have a, also have a dashboard to visualize and track the infected and death count um, at the both state level and county level. And this dashboard was launched on um, March 27th, 2020. Okay, uh, so next thing I want to talk about uh, is the, the county level features as we know that uh, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a, a very different uh, feature or characteristics for each county in the United States. So we try to um, put this information into our analysis. Um, so we studied uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, county level features. Um, these can be divided into uh, six groups. So for example, um, the demographic information, um, the geographic information, uh, social economic information. Uh, we also put uh, the control policy done by the local government and the health infrastructure and urban rural um, factors. So all the factors will play um, a role in our uh, modeling. So we collected this data from uh, um, U.S. Census Bureau and the U.S. Department of Home, Homeland Security. Uh, so for example, you can see in the control policy, uh, we put like uh, uh, the uh, government declarations. Um, we also, such as the social distancing and shelter in place. And in the demographic information, we included a, a lot of uh, uh, minority information, such as uh, the percentage of uh, um, African-American, uh, the percentage of uh, Hispanic and uh, Latino. Also, we consider the like, uh, population density, uh, the age distribution, and uh, also like uh, the male to female ratio. So uh, we, we, we have uh, many variables uh, to uh, explain the county level features. I'm curious for just uh, just a second, because um, I see the urban versus rural divide as a creature of the suburbs myself. Uh, how how does like a suburban uh, population where where what's the cutoff that helps you determine that? Um, actually, we got this uh, uh, percentage. We got this percentage of urban rural from uh, uh, U.S. Census Bureau. So this comes with a percentage. So we treat it as a continuous variable. I always like a good continuous variable. <laughs> So that's not a really a cutoff, it's a continuous variable. All right, so um, now um, actually modeling the current COVID-19 outbreak is a, a very challenging task. Uh, the, the main reason is because we know very little things about the disease. So up till now, scientists still don't uh, know everything about uh, how this virus is transmitted. And due to the lack of widespread testing, we still don't know um, how prevalent exactly this is. We don't know if the virus will show a strong seasonality um, or show any like a seasonal effect. So it's, it's quite challenging and there's a lot of uncertainty about what is observed. Um, also, it's kind of challenging to measure and model the contact rates between like, uh, um, successful people and infectious people. Uh, not only like, uh, uh, under physical distancing policies, but also in various uh, reopening scenarios. So, so the contact rates will be really a hard thing to predict during such a rapid, um, rapid ch changing crisis. So it's, a, it's a really a key source of model uncertainty. Um, as also you have seen that uh, the dynamics of the spread is uh, highly nonlinear and there's, uh, the, the problem is uh, even more complicated once you consider the uh, spatial non-stationarity. So all of these make um, um, modeling of the COVID-19 very challenging. And uh, for the uh, for forecast part, so we really try to 
um, answer the following questions. So we uh, separated the short-term uh, forecast and long-term forecast due to uh, many reasons. Uh, I will explain those later. But uh, the main question we try to answer are the following. Can we provide an accurate short-term forecast? Um, how far the virus will spread and how many lives it will claim? Um, can we project the timing of the um, outbreak peak and the number of house resources required at the peak? Also, we try to understand what is the uncertainty associated with our forecast. So we, our research try to um, answer all of the above forecast questions. Okay, so um, in the following, I'm going to introduce our spatial temporal epidemic uh, modeling framework. Um, there are a lot of steps uh, which have already been made to model and forecast uh, the spread and mortality of COVID-19. Um, the classical disease transmission model was created by um, Professor Kermack McKendrick in 1927. So in this model, the disease transmission is uh, actually uh, conveniently uh, conceptualized by uh, passage among members uh, as a population like uh, moving among compartments. So usually you have seen the, this model. It has uh, uh, three compartments, such as a susceptible infection and uh, removed. So this is a special case of the SIR model. Um, the SIR models are widely used in epidemiological studies. It functions very well for like um, infectious disease with um, little um, um, immunity against reinfection or disease with no immunity. So uh, you can see on these slides, um, the, the, the SIR model uh, capture the dynamics uh, of the um, disease mechanism, me, me, mechanisms, and we as usually assume the um, the um, the rate of picture uh, people get infected uh, that is proportional to um, the people of uh, um, the people um, the people of infected, and also the people uh, that it is susceptible. So. Um, we call this kind of model the, um, the bi bilinear incidence rate SIR model. However, um, this assumption usually uh, may not necessarily hold in reality. Uh, for example, um, like uh, given the strict social distancing or like uh, self-quarantine, the number of effective uh, um, contacts between infected individuals and susceptible individuals um, they may, uh, this may uh, decrease uh, at a high infective level. So um, the incidence rate uh, will, not, uh, will not be um, the same, and they may be smaller than the linear rate. So based on these reasons, we consider some nonlinear incidence rates. So we, we consider even a more general case uh, compared with the original SIR model. So here we introduced the two parameters, up one and up two, which will help to capture the nonlinear incidence rate. Um, so based on this model, um, we, uh, we can bring the epidemic data and uh, instead of doing an ODE, we could consider a, a regression problem. So you can see if I, um, let me introduce some, some notation. So if I use IT, um, be uh, use IT as the cumulative active cases and YT as the new cases, then we can consider um, a generalized linear regression model to uh, fit the data and get the estimates of the parameters. So that's the basic idea of the, um, the SIR model. So before I, I introduce, um, before I introduce our uh, modeling and forecast, uh, I want to talk about uh, the two main models, uh, two main scientific models uh, you often see in the, um, in the news about COVID-19. Um, so I'd like to compare um, the mathematical models 
and statistical models. And this is really a, a tail of two fields. Um, as you can see in the dynamics of the sub model, um, they can inform us the like the deterministic skeleton on which the um, on which the behavior of the corresponding stochastic uh, um, systems are built. Um, but it only represents it only it only represents uh, the average behavior, and also also um, the the focus of the mathematical models usually they are on just on the model form itself. Um, they are not interested in like a parameter estimation for observed data. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with the statistical modeling, we know statistical models allow the data to speak for themselves. And usually there are two kinds of uh, tracks to reach conclusions from data using statistical models. And the, the first one assumes that data are generated by like a given stochastic data model. And the second one uh, usually um, um, use some arithmetic models and treat the data mechanisms as unknown. Um, in like epidemiological modeling, um, regression methods are often used in public health because it produces a nice combination of variables with weights that give it the indication of the variable importance. And also it provides a very neat results of how the predictors affect the response. However, um, pure statistical models can only describe the observed data. And very often, um, statistical models focus on the pattern and there's little information given about the mechanism. So um, in general, statistical models are not very well suited for long-term predictions. Yeah, I just wanted to pause on this slide for a second because again, when I was looking through uh, the slides, you know, this was the ones that got me really excited because I think that this is a really important distinction to make, particularly for say early career statisticians or applied mathematicians. A lot of the times um, mathematicians applied statisticians, they all sort of get lumped into the same categories. They're people who use mathematics and mathematical models to model phenomena. But the fact is, these are two very distinct fields. They're quite related, and there's been a lot of work on how to better integrate these two fields and uh, provide the best of both worlds. And I think that your, your research example is one of those where you're trying to combine both those two issues. But I think this is a really important issue to focus on, particularly understanding what the strengths and weaknesses of these different models are, where um, when they are talking about these mathematical models, a great many of them are not really using data or data in any great numbers um, or data, data as a, like a, high, a very strong aspect of this. I think also uh, uh, pointing out the determinism of a lot of these mathematical models is interesting because basically a lot of the times it's that um, these parameters that go into the mathematical models, perhaps they're estimated, perhaps they're not, but the idea is you sort of run it through the system, see what the result is, and then compare it to what observations would be. And that's the way you sort of assess these models um, as opposed to exactly um, fitting those parameters and those models according to what you've observed, which is the, the more statistical approach to them. So I think that this is a really nice slide that um, summarizes an important point, And I think a point that's been missed a lot um, when they're comparing models with two different types, uh, comparing models that come from these two different approaches. So again, I really, I really appreciate this slide because it clarifies, I think, a big, two big uh, approaches to modeling and what the strengths and weaknesses of both of them are. Okay. So um, next, I'm going to introduce our spatial temporal epidemic modeling framework. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a, 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 a very complex um, dynamics, um, both in time and space, especially to handle the spatial non-stationarity. We assume um, the new cases uh, generated uh, follow a generalized spatially varying coefficient model. So our like uh, uh, framework consists of uh, three equations. So let me introduce the first two equations here. So suppose, uh, remember we are doing at the county level. So suppose that there are n counties. Uh, for county I uh, on day T, 
uh, we assume the conditional expectation of the new cases um, satisfy uh, the following generalized spatially varying coefficient model. So uh, on the right hand side, this is uh, the log of the conditional expectation for um, county i at day t. And then on the right hand side, we have a uh, um, infection information. So IT here is the cumulative active cases um, at, uh, at T minus one for county I. And we assume this effect, the dynamic effect varies um, from different location to location. So here we have uh, uh, the geographic information uh, modeled like the latitude and longitude for each county. And we assume the effect varies from county to county. And also, we included a lot of local features. As I mentioned, we have many covariates. So for example, the, the control policy. So we put a control policy from different local government. And we also considered many other local characteristics, uh, such as like uh, the Gini index, um, which is a matter to, uh, to see the the, the economic in the local county. And we also put many other features like uh, the county's influ uh, affluence uh, and the disadvantage level. And we also put like uh, urban and rural um, feature, also like uh, some demographic information as I introduced like uh, the ratio of uh, African-American, ratio of Hispanic, uh, male-female ratio, um, and the age distribution for the old, and also like a population density. We also consider the um, health in infrastructure, like the total number of hospital beds in the county. And we also consider the, um, uh, this EHPC, that is um, the local government expenditures uh, for, uh, for health per capita and also like uh, um, the percent of uh, persons under 65 years old without uh, health uh, insurance coverage. So all of these we put in the model and you can, we can actually continue to add more um, later. Um, for example, like uh, um, the, the usage of the uh, masks and also like the mobility data. We can also put those um, in our model as long as you have this data accessible. So, um, so this is the, the, part, uh, the first part of our, our um, modeling framework for the infectious account. And we, we did something similar for the death account. So this is a, a similar model. Uh, the, the, the difference is on the left-hand side, we instead of model infectious um, count, we model the, the, the new increased fatal cases. And similarly, we allow this uh, fatality rate uh, vary from uh, location to location. And you can also put uh, like uh, um, different uh, uh, features for the, the county level yeah, as long as you have those data. Um, so these two together are uh, also we, plus the recovery rate, we can actually um, have a three compartment in our modeling and we can use some regression method to, to fit the model. So to fit the model, um, you can read the details in our paper, but so we basically con considered the um, a so-called moving window approach to capture the um, dynamics, the temple dynamics. We used a quasi-likelihood moving window quasi likelihood approach to estimate uh, um, the coefficients uh, um, and also the, the functions uh, in the models. So due to the time constraint, I will not explain all the details. Uh, I'll refer you to read our uh, paper uh, on archive. Great, and the uh, link to that paper will be provided in the uh, video description. So uh, you can very quickly go and check out Lily's paper. Okay. Uh, so um, for the rest of the um, session, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, forecasting. So uh, I'm going to first mention um, how difficult it is to, to forecast the COVID-19. Um, so uh, I want to say uh, for 
short-term forecast, this is uh, relatively easy. Um, here on the left-hand side of the slides, uh, I put some of the time series plots. Um, the first one like uh, the, 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 for the whole United States and some uh, state level time series and county level time series. And you can see from this time series, they have a very clear time series trend. And uh, so you can consider many methods to, um, to do the forecast. And there's less uncertainty about what is observed in short term. Um, I have seen some well-constructed statistical models they have been used to do the short-term forecast. For example, um, you could use the time series analysis approach. You also can consider the regression method and also machine learning, um, some data, machine learning data tools can also be used to do this short-term forecast. And this is also very important for po policy makers. Um, they can use the short-term forecast to allocate resources or plan interventions for the short term. Okay, um, but for um, the po policy makers and decision makers, they all very interested in um, also the long-term forecast, especially about the epidemiological dynamics. For example, uh, like uh, when will the peak occur? Uh, when will the resurgence happen? And what is the intervention efficiency? So um, to answer these questions, uh, we need to have a, a long-term forecast. And the long-term forecast is usually much harder compared to um, the short-term forecast. It's, it's actually much harder than many people think. So like uh, with emerging disease, uh, such as COVID-19, many bi uh, uh, bi biology features um, of the transmission is very hard to, um, to, to, to measure. Um, and many of these things are, are uh, kind of remain unknown. So um, I, want to su I want to summarize it, the, the challenges in, in three parts. The first part is uh, we, um, how well we understand the factors that contribute to, to the disease. There are many, like, uh, many, uh, many unknown things. Researchers know very little about a disease. And also, we don't have reliable data. So um, we, are, we, we see the data from different open resources, but we are certainly also missing a substantial number of cases due to the testing or under-reported ratio, delayed reported ratio. Um, so there are a lot of things so we may not um, we may not, uh, we may not um, sure about the, the data quality. So there's a lack of reliable data. And also the forecast we made might um, affect what we are trying to, to forecast. So for example, uh, let's see if the CDC uh, says, okay, in the next few months, uh, um, we'll have a, a, a big problem will have much more increased cases, then the local government might, might consider uh, lock, lockdown again. So the, the forecast may also affect what we, we try to forecast. So this makes the, all the problems uh, very, very challenging and make, could make the long-term forecast less um, imprecise. So, so it's, uh, I would say it's useful for policymakers to, um, um, to prepare for the surges. So it's still quite useful, um, but uh, um, we need to be very careful when we interpret the results from modeling. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about a, a, a famous quote from a, a statistician, George Box. Uh, all models are wrong, but some are you, very useful. So this is exactly the case when we uh, try to forecast uh, COVID-19 using scientific models. Um, so when you read the, or interpret the results from scientific models, we need to be very careful. And the first thing I want to, uh, I want to remind you to, to check very carefully is the assumptions they put in the model. So all these models uh, make some kind of assumptions. So before I introduce our method, I also want to um, 
uh, state the assumptions we put in our model. So here, our first assumption we made is about the data. We assume the data we considered or we studied uh, is from a reliable data source. So we didn't consider the, uh, the, 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 the underreported issue. Uh, and we, we assume uh, all the counties, all the local government, they are testing uh, sufficiently. Um, as we have seen that the test results um, have struggled with the relative like uh, capabilities and testing procedures and preparedness of um, infections. So all of these make the comparison a very um, non-trivial task. But uh, to make it easy, let's first assume the, the counties are doing a good job. They are testing sufficiently. And later, um, after we got the results, we can do some adjustment to if we believe something goes wrong in some county. Um, also, this, the third assumption we made is that uh, the future um, that we forecast will continue to follow the same um, pattern that we observed currently. Um, and the first assumption is about uh, the um, spatial heterogeneity and time variant dynamics. So we assume um, the infection rate, contact rate, uh, incidence rate, all of these we assume they are uh, spatially heterogeneous and time varying. And we also uh, assume recovery rate uh, follow some kind of assumption. The re recovery rate is very like, um, complicated right now. The reason is because we don't have a uniform criterion to decide um, the cases that are recovered. So up till now, um, a CDC and many other official um, agencies, they still not give a, a very um, uniform criterion. So uh, in our analysis, we assumed uh, the recovery rate is the same across different counties and time. Uh, just try to make our analysis easier. Okay, now um, let's talk about how to um, do the, the prediction. So as I mentioned in our project, we considered both the short-term prediction and long-term prediction. So um, this flow chart here shows you the procedure to conduct uh, uh, each step ahead uh, prediction. So this is uh, pretty similar to um, like the time series uh, you have seen um, in, uh, in the test book. So the basic idea is that we um, interactively update uh, the, uh, the cumulative cases, like the new cases, cumulative cases from each compartment. Um, based on our models. And then we can like uh, do it uh, iteratively um, and then obtain uh, each head uh, um, prediction. So again, due to the time constraint, I will not explain all the details. I will also, um, also refer you to read our papers on the archive. Then the next question you might ask is how accurate um, your forecast? So as I, uh, I mentioned, the short-term forecast um, is easy to evaluate. So actually, we considered some experiments to investigate the accuracy of the short-term forecast, like the seven-day forecast, a four, a four weeks ahead forecast. Uh, so we have um, done some experiments, and the results showed that our uh, short-term forecast is quite accurate. And if you are also interested in the comparison with other methods, I will recommend you to go to this uh, um, forecast hub. So this is the link of the forecast hub. Um, this, um, this hub actually, uh, they, connect, they, they collect the COVID-19 forecast from many uh, teams. And they combine the forecast um, in this dashboard with a standard format. Uh, we are one of the teams to, to offer this kind of forecast. And uh, so you can see this green one here, four dots, that shows our four weeks uh, ahead forecast. Um, and also we can see uh, other teams. So there are about uh, 10 teams, um, or more than 10 teams offer such kind of a forecast. So if you are interested in 
into seeing the comparison, you can go to this uh, forecast hub and you can see here, we are here. Uh, it's right in the middle of uh, all the forecasts from other teams. Okay, uh, and then about all the forecasts, uh, one question is very crucial to um, assess the uncertainty of the forecast. So to provide the uncertainty, we also developed a method using the bootstrap to construct the projection band. Um, so there are a lot of uncertainty uh, that can be associated with the forecast. So in our um, analysis, we mainly consider two sources. Um, the first source is from the estimation. So from our model estimation, we could see some uh, variations. And we may also see some bias problem. So we correct the, bi the, the bias and generate the bootstrap sample um, and also generate the forecast path at different time points. So uh, the second type of variation is from the individual paths generated using our model. So these two kind of variation together um, uh, become our main um, um, uncertainty to get the prediction band. So as I said, we use the bootstrap so we can re repeat the bootstrap procedure uh, many times and we can get many passes and uh, to obtain like a, a 101 minus alpha percent um, prediction band, we can leave out uh, the alpha percent, the, the most extreme passes and then the remainder will be able to use it as the projection band. So um, by leaving the passes out and also doing the, so the bootstrap, we can actually uh, build the projection band. Again, I will uh, leave the details to, uh, to you to read the paper. So now let's uh, take a look of one of the forecast results in the long term. So this slide, uh, shows you the long-term projection for the United States um, in the next four months. Um, it shows uh, the cumulative positive cases. Um, the, the, the forecast um, is based on the data collected from May 28th to June 11th. And you can see um, the blue curve. The blue curve here shows the um, observed data and the yellow curve here shows the projection in the next four months. And the, the yellow band here is the, uh, the projection band, which should try to give you the uncertainty about our method. So as I mentioned, uh, we, to get this result, we assume that the, the current pattern will remain the same till the end of the uh, forecasting period. For example, um, we assume the current interventions will be uh, the same um, till the end of the forecasting period. So this is the infection projection and the next one shows you the um, US cumulative uh, death projection for the next uh, four months. And you can see after four months we predict uh, like uh, there will be around 150,000 deaths uh, for the entire United States. Again, uh, this is based on the current intervention um, assumption. Um, to compare um, different uh, projection method, um, actually CDC works with partners to bring together um, weekly forecast for COVID-19 death. Um, so um, these forecasts have been developed independently um, and shared publicly. So you can go to the CDC web, web page to see the national forecast and also state level forecast. Um, um, you can see um, there are about uh, 15 to 20 teams submitted their forecast every day, uh, every week. Um, these forecasts are used as uh, uh, and combined and used as uh, the ensemble forecast. So we are very lucky to be um, uh, one of the teams um, provided a certain kind of a forecast for CDC. So here is our team and we are, I think we are kind of in the middle of these um, around 10 or 15 curves. 
So you can go to CDC and see the comparison from different research teams. Okay, and finally, I want to uh, introduce our um, data products. So based on our research findings, we have uh, um, established a COVID-19 um, dashboard with many r shining apps. Um, we, uh, we provide currently provide a real-time seven-day forecast and uh, two months and four months ahead of projection for both the infected and death counts up to the county level. And we also provide some corresponding analysis at the county level. Um, so our dashboard was launched on uh, March 27th, and we updated the daily for displaying the results. And um, you can actually see this, you can scan this QR code here to assess our um, dashboard. Um, besides the um, forecast, we also provide a, a lot of like a, a series of uh, statistical insights associated um, with the dashboard. They provide some highlight indicators that tend to be less visible, but um, they also provide some interesting evidence for the analysis and the policy, uh, policy making related to COVID-19. So you can go there and uh, see our statistical analysis and uh, um, insights also. Okay, so this slide um, shows show you where you can find our product and data, also the research papers. So so far, we, we published two um, two papers on archive. And the first one is about the methodology paper, um, our which introduced our modeling and forecast. And the second paper is about big data. Uh, which shows uh, how we actually combine uh, and integrated the data from different sources. We also like uh, um, put um, um, some R packages um, to introduce how to um, perform the analysis using our proposed method. Um, two R packages you can find from here. And the first one talks about estimation and forecast. And the second one uh, introduces how to do data cleaning and integration. Um, so um, you're welcome to go there and download it, the, the R packages and try it for your data analysis. Yeah, this is really great. Um, I, I really like how you've clarified. You haven't just made a contribution by providing these forecasts and these estimations. Um, you're providing a contribution by uh, looking at the methodology and also by the data that you're providing to the rest of the uh, community. And I think it's really great to have that clarified in this. Um, and these links will be provided in the uh, video description below. So uh, if you're on that YouTube channel and want to look at it right away, you can go to those. Um, I know I certainly will be because I think even if you aren't interested, for example, in monitoring COVID-19, but are interested in more of these uh, spatial temporal aspects, Looking at this data and the data cleaning in that process, they put a lot of thought into it. They've done a lot of that sort of, you know, pre-thinking and pre-planning. So if you're trying to, if you're interested in any more like general spatial temporal or uh, county-wide statistics approaches, this is a great way to get a head start on making headway in a study like that. So I, I think it's great and very applicable, even if you aren't explicitly interested in COVID-19. So I think this is a really great contribution. Uh, so finally, I would like to introduce all the contributors to our project. So we are very lucky to have a great team. Everybody works very hard and puts a lot of efforts to this project. We have been holding all of the group meetings remotely since uh, the outbreak. Um, to develop the dashboard efficiently, uh, we divide the whole team into several subgroups. Um, we have subgroups like uh, uh, working on the data collection and data cleaning, uh, some groups uh, working on the how to implement the statistical models uh, and R packages, uh, software uh, development, uh, and uh, shiny apps dashboard. So I, I just feel like uh, we, I would like to thank everybody who worked so hard uh, on this project. We really have a good team. So since the um, dashboard was launched, we have uh, also scheduled a daily like a brief meeting uh, to discuss the release and the forecast. And uh, especially the graduate students, they work so hard. Um, 
in order to like release our data forecast on time, many of them have to work in the midnight. Um, so the, in the midnight, they clean the data and perform the analysis, everything, and then they work till the morning to uh, produce the um, results um, um, accurately so we can confidently make the release. So I'd like to thank all of them for um, being such a wonderful team members for this project. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. Well, Lily, uh, that was a great presentation. Thanks so much. I like how you really brought together a large number of aspects. One, clarifying the number of uh, mechanistic uh, challenges that come with trying to model something like COVID-19 with the uh, geographic variability, the demographic variability. There's a large number of factors coming in. And I appreciate that you, uh, you know, you, you put in the hard work that was required to try to account for many of these things. Um, and, um, uh, and I appreciate, you know, that there are a large number of biological, epidemiological, um, and uh, medical mechanisms all working together, you know, in recognizing that saying biological mechanisms, epidemiological mechanisms, uh, medical uh, mechanisms, those aren't synonymous uh, terms, they aren't synonymous processes, and that there's a large number of things coming in. Um, also, in appreciation of what the forecasting differences are, these long term versus short term forecasts. And, um, of course, uh, the comparison uh, between uh, mathematical modeling and statistical modeling, which while highly related, there are key differences that are important to appreciate when you're trying to evaluate these things. So I think uh, for especially for early career students, this is a great presentation to watch, to understand and learn from an expert like Lily. Here's how you break down a problem that is very complex into something that is more tractable and believable. And then what I think is really appreciated is um, Lily weighs out the the uh, assumptions and the different components. So you can the model is now correctable. Um, so you can better evaluate the model and uh, by making by Lily and her team making that transparent, that is useful to science. And I, I think that this, the, this is a great example of a contribution of statistics to medical science. Um, so Lily, thank you again for you and your team. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me today. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, folks, it's Glenn. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Pod of Asclepius. If so, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and hitting that subscribe and bell button for a small channel and every bit helps. If you have a department, a lab, or even just friends who would like this episode, definitely forward it along. I don't have any of those things, but if you do, you should definitely celebrate by sending them an episode. We've got plenty of episodes on healthcare topics, particularly on data science and machine learning, so check out the other episodes on the channel or some of the playlists. You can also check out our website to join our mailing list or see our sponsors. Thanks so much to our sponsors for their support. And while the views discussed on the show are undoubtedly scintillating, they don't necessarily represent the views of our sponsors, the speaker's employer, my views, your views, my neighbor's cat's views, your cat's views, or anyone else not saying the words. In fact, they might not even represent the speaker's views by the time you're hearing it, so be sure to subscribe in case they come back onto the show to change their mind. See what I did there? Thanks again.